free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we're free at last. In honor of Martin Luther King Jr., we are going to apply those amazing words that he spoke in the I Have a Dream speech to our lives and our focus in this episode. So stick with us. We're going to jump right in. Hey guys, and welcome to another exciting episode of Your Life, God's Word. Thanks for joining this time of relevant conversation and scriptural application where we apply God's Word to the most important areas of life, God, family, and community. We pray this broadcast inspires, encourages, challenges, and blesses you in every way. So without further ado, let's dive right in to this week's episode. When we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, Free at last. Thank God Almighty. We are free at last. Those words were spoken August 28, 1963, in the March on Washington. Many people who study history know this very well, that the time was one of turmoil. The one one thing that was consistent during that time was that nothing was consistent. There was lots of unrest. There were lots of things going on. And in the uh, middle of the Civil Rights Movement, we had this March on Washington where Martin Luther King Jr., a doctor, a reverend, however you want to title him, this man stood up and gave this incredible speech. I mean, it's just under 18 minutes. It wasn't some long, you know, massive oration, but it had so much ump and so much amazing content to it that people talk about it. It's archived. Uh, I mean, if you want to go watch it on YouTube, you can see some of the recordings. You can look at the uh, the text. You can get that online. I would encourage you to do so just to kind of go back and see what some of the things they were going through and some of the things that these folks, I mean, people like... Martin Luther King, uh, put their lives on the line. And and we know, of course, he actually truly did. And they really stake their reputations, their their lives, everything for what they believed in. And I think there's a lot of points that we can draw out of this speech, of the things that they were pushing, the things that he believed in, and we can apply them to our lives Today, we we can look at some of the struggles that they had, we'll say, in the natural, and we can show and see that that is stuff that we deal with in the supernatural, in the spiritual, in the, the context of our walk with Christ. Now, understand that the struggle that they had was very real. They actually dealt with real institutional racism. I mean, they were not up against some boogeyman. They were up against an immoral and unjust system, and they really did have to have to just step out in faith and believe that God was going to help them. And as we go through this uh, today, we'll actually see the, the faith of folks like uh, Martin Luther King Jr., who uh, who believed firmly in God and grounded a lot of his uh, discourse in the the tenets of the Bible. But we'll get into that in a little bit here. Understand, again, the context of this thing. People are being oppressed. They are living lives that are less than what has truly been provided for them. He addresses this in his speech, and we'll go through it in just a second. Not word for word through the speech, but through different highlights that I find very um, 
almost prophetic in a way, because when you look at what we're going through today, there are so many things that people deal with today, especially in their lives with Christ, that if, if they would just awaken, if they would have the faith to really just rise up and, and get a hold of God and walk as God truly wants them to and has already purchased for their lives— they would see much greater freedom, much greater liberty, and things around them change. Things in their families, communities, and uh, and just general life all around. So why don't we just just dive into this a little bit here. One thing that I found very interesting, and again, I'm not going through the speech word for word or even necessarily chronologically. You can go and check it out, and like I said, I would encourage you to, to do so. However, he points back... Toward the end of the speech, he points back to the founding documents, the founders, and brings up the fact that in in the creedal statements of this country, all men are created equal. All men are created equal. And of course, we know that the, the founding fathers were were folks that believed in God. And I know people try to argue, well, they were mostly deists. You know, they were it was a, it was no, no, a couple of them I think were. You got like Jefferson and Franklin, but a lot of these guys attended church. A lot of these folks were were Christians, not just some, you know, some hypothetical theoretical god type essence. Um no, when they said god, they meant they meant Jesus. And and the reason why uh and when they said, you know, his word or things of that nature, they meant the scriptures. They meant the Bible. And the reason why they didn't put a whole lot of the specificity into it was because they didn't want to establish a um, you know a, a religious country in the sense that there was a state defined religion a state religion and you had to be this or else rather they wanted the the founding to be based on scriptural principles they wanted it to be based on the things of God and they grounded their argumentation, much of it, in the things of God, in in the principles of the kingdom of God. And as much as they could, in their official documents, things like the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, you know, that you don't see them mentioning church and, and Jesus in there. But in their writings, many times, they they are very clear in what they are talking about. So, getting back to the, the I Have a Dream speech— we find that uh, he brings up all men are created equal, and then he talks about how this is the this is the ideal. This is what this country was truly founded on. He doesn't make the case that this country was never founded on this at all. They didn't really mean it. He points out, no, they meant it. This is what it was founded on, and then he gives a uh, a proclamation that America was not living up to its own standards. That at the time, they were emancipated, and, and, and you actually see him go back to and give honor to Abraham Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation. But he says, yeah, we were, we were freed technically back then, but there is this, this immoral and unjust system that is continued to force us to live less than what is truly Provided not just by the Emancipation Proclamation, but by the original documents of the country. One of the things that he that he says, I love. I mean, he just had a way with words. He had an awesome, like, just speaking voice. It was amazing. So I'm not going to do any of this justice. However, um, he said that he wanted you know the children, uh, black children coming up the next couple of generations that that they not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. You know, this was, this was uh, revolutionary, but, I mean, today it's like, well, yeah, of course. But, but no, back then, I mean, it, it just didn't matter. It just did not matter. There was segregation, and that was that. And so, you know, we have to make sure that we understand the context of what, when he was giving this speech, but look at these things that he proclaims and talks about in this, uh, you know, 17 and a half, whenever it is, minutes of, um, of his I Have a Dream speech. Now, check this out. I love this quote here. In the process of gaining our rightful place, 
we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protests to de- uh, sorry to degenerate into physical violence. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of mending physical force with soul force. This must not lead us to distrust all white people. For many of our white brothers, as evidenced by their presence here today, have come to realize that their destiny is tied up with our destiny. Isn't that amazing? I mean, he, he, he was not in any way, shape, or form uh, a proponent of hatred, of violence, uh, wrongful deeds. I mean... It, even he even talks about internal things like bitterness. I mean, he d- we, we don't even don't be bitter. Don't let your actions arise out of bitterness. See, they were standing up against a truly immoral thing, a a truly unjust, racist system, where laws were written on the books. I mean, this you know this this was a place where I mean, you talk about how easy. It must have been to to let things like bitterness well up in you. Can you imagine, my goodness, can you imagine walking into a place and you have whites and blacks up on a sign and you have different bathrooms? I mean, I, di- I didn't grow up in that situation, but you, I mean, how how, wow, for a man to get up and say, We cannot allow this to embitter us. We cannot allow this to get a hold of of who we are and dictate our actions, dictate how we think, dictate our thought process. He had, I mean, he had a hold of some scriptural principles. Again, people often, and I I mean no disrespect by calling him Martin Luther King or just just saying Martin Luther King Jr., um, but I mean, You know, he was Dr. Martin Luther King, but he was Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. And many people kind of, you know, today in the secularization of much of our society and, you know, the politic, the politic, how do you say that word? Politicization? (laughs) Sometimes I just have a hard time. My my brain gets ahead of my my mouth here. Um, But the, everything's political. And so, you know, we can't, we can't address these things. Well, I'm going to address it right here. This man was a reverend. He quoted scripture, he preached and taught the things of God, Uh, and so we need to recognize that he had an understanding of what things like bitterness and unforgiveness and hatred getting inside of the human heart, he understood what those types of things could really lead to and really do. I mean, check out some of these uh, some of these quotes that are attributed to Martin Luther King, and uh, he may not have come up with these completely, you know, in the original, but he certainly popularized them and believed um, what they what they said. I haven't done enough research in the archives to know for certain the source of these, but he certainly made them popular, and they are often attributed directly to him. So I have no reason to doubt that he said, "Forgiveness is not an occasional act." It is a constant attitude. My, 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 I can promise you that is the truth. Today you forgave and you feel good and you feel free and you feel just, oh, I'm walking with God and, you know, I've forgiven someone that's done me wrong. Tomorrow, something reminds you of something they did. (laughs) You gotta, you gotta do it all over again. So it's a, it is a constant attitude. He also said, we must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive. He who is devoid of the power to forgive is devoid of the power to love. My goodness, isn't that so true? And as we get into uh, this thing a little bit deeper, we're going to go through some of the scriptures and various things, and we'll see that that indeed is a scriptural uh, principle. But you got to understand that 
the context of this thing is people having a system that treats them as second-class citizens, folks. Why? Because of the color of their skin. Now, that... So many people born, you know, decades later, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine. But we got, I mean, try a little bit. That is unbelievable that someone would come and say, hey, we need, in this context, we need to forgive. We cannot be embittered. We cannot rise up with hatred. Rather, we have to do things in love. And he goes on and talks about how, once again, this should not lead us to distrust white folks. Uh, this One of the worst things that you find in our society today, and again, it's not everyone, of course not, but many places you go, it's like racism is bad, and then they turn around and, and it's reverse racism. I, I, you, you probably recall situations like uh, a, a couple of years ago, there was an Evergreen College or whatever, there was this... Uh, group, you know, a large body of students. It was basically like a all whites stay home day. And there was a, a professor that, you know, decided I'm not going to do that. And it was a huge thing. And, and a lot of the media and stuff made it like it was th- this guy was the problem. Don't you know, this was a, if you're white, you're supposed to stay home day. Well, I mean, again, Martin Luther King did not see um, hate for hate as an option. He didn't see, well, we need to reverse the racism and now we need to, you know, we we need to we need to hammer whites, we need to hammer Asians, we need to come down on Spanish folks. I mean, he it, it wasn't equal opportune racism. It was let's eliminate racism altogether. And the way he uh the way he propagated that was through an attitude that said no bitterness, no hate. Let's not be doing violence. Let's not be causing a ruckus, but rather, let's love. Let's love. What a powerful message. And again, with uh, with with the you know the the annual day upon us, I think it's good to give honor what where honor is due, and you know thank you, Doctor Martin Luther King, Reverend. Martin Luther King Jr., thank you for your contributions to what you have done to society. And may we all live up to these these tenets of equality, justice, morality, love. Let us all see to it, as you said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So let me continue on this theme, but switch gears a little bit here and and start talking in the context of our walk with Christ. Understand that many of these concepts are, are things that we really need to be living by as we live our lives in the Spirit. So, for instance, we go back to the fact that in the I Have a Dream speech, Martin Luther King takes it back to the original founding. He takes it back. Let's go back to a point in the sand, a foundation. And as we walk with Christ... We, we really, so many churches, for instance, let's take a church, a denomination, a, a person, an organization, whatever it might be. So often when we're trying to, you know, refresh, re, revamp, or trying to refocus, do we go back to the original? Do we go back to the Word of God, open up the, the Bible, go to the New Testament? Where was the church established? What, what did they do? Or do we so often just go back to, well, you know, back 50 years ago when this specific church was established, or, you know, 120 years ago when this denomination kind of sprouted up, or, you know, five or 600 years ago when some creedal statement was, was officially adopted and accepted. Well, I think we'll get into trouble 
if we do that, and we don't go all the way back to the scriptures and try to see the foundation, we call it the founding documents of the faith, right? That's the Bible. Uh, we know the church was born in the book of Acts. Let's go look and read through and see what they did. We know that Paul, Peter, right? They wrote to the church in the epistles. Let's go see you know, what they had to say to the early church about the tenets of the faith and the principles of the kingdom of God. I also like the fact that, again, in the I Have a Dream speech, he gives honor to folks that have come before. I mean, he mentions... Um, the, the Emancipation Proclamation, and, and, you know, in giving honor, a nod to Abraham Lincoln, he's acknowledging people have gone before and even, well, think about it, really paid the ultimate price. But think about this. Do we give honor to those that have gone before? I mean, do we find it easy to forget the, the sacrifice that people have, I mean, I mean, have paid, have gone through the price people have paid for where we are today, do we give honor to 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 folks that that maybe had to step out in faith, whereas we can take it for granted because right a decade ago they did this and now we reap the benefits. I I, I do like that, and I think that's something else in our walk with Christ that we should just continually give honor. All, I mean, all the way back, of course, right to Jesus Christ and you know to the apostles, but but even you know people in our own assembly that have that have paid the price in prayer and dug things out for us. You know, if you go to a you go to a, a, a service and in that local service on that particular day there happens to be a a great pouring out of the Spirit, and I mean miracles happen. Somebody gets the you know the infilling of the Holy Spirit, and you know somebody over here. Uh, I mean, they get healed miraculously of, of cancer, or they had a surgery scheduled, and boom, they don't have to have that anymore. They were healed. I mean, do we take it for granted that, that just kind of happens? Just, you know, just kind of everybody just rolled out of bed, and it just it just happened that way, you know, just random chant. No, people were praying. People were fasting. People came with expectation and faith. There was probably people there early to to put in some prayer. Maybe they, they practiced so that they could get up and confidently lead worship without worrying about <laughs> messing up. So once you get that out of the way, now you can focus on God and ushering in his presence. Or someone may have, I mean, blood, sweat, and tears into the teaching and preaching that was delivered. And, and, and then you've got the ministry of the body that happens when we, you know, when we flow through the service. Maybe you have an altar call of some sort. Uh, and, and, and wow, it just, that didn't just happen. We should give honor where honor is due. And the scriptures actually do tell us to give honor where honor is due. So the other thing that I that I think is is very interesting, again, we spent some time talking about the, you know, in the speech itself, is this notion of forgiveness and and love. And I think it's very important for Christians to realize, you know, the words of Jesus in John 13, John 13, 35 specifically, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples. Now, if we were to stop right there, what? Okay, so Jesus is pulling the disciples together, and he's saying, hey, here is the thing. This is going to let people know you are my disciples. Huh. What is it that we would insert there? The correct doctrine. It's all about how to be saved. This is how, when you have the consistent message uh, or is it the demonstration of the Spirit? That's how people are going to know you're my disciples. This is the way. N mm, think about that for a second. What would you put in there? Well, Jesus put in, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And I don't want to completely dive into a study um on love itself. I think we're going to do that in a future podcast, but let me let me just go through 1 Corinthians 13. When Jesus said love, he had a specific thing in mind, okay? He didn't it wasn't the, like a worldly pop song kind of love. Uh <laughs> that uh no, that's not actually love. This is what he means. 1 Corinthians 13 uh Paul starts off with if I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am only 
a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but I have not love, I gain nothing. So let's stop right there for a second. I mean, he is not in any way saying that, you know, we shouldn't be speaking in the tongues of men and angels or, you know, prophecy is a problem or being charitable is, you know, an issue. But what is he saying? The motivation of all that we do, if it's right doctrine, if it's a move and demonstration of the Spirit, if it's mighty faith and demonstration, if it's giving and charitable contribution, it needs to be love. Not look at me, not proving somebody wrong, not it needs to be love. And he defines love. Verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there's knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things, or I put childish ways behind me. Verse 12, Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. That's the kind of love that Jesus is talking about when he says, This is how people are going to know you're my disciples. Is that the kind of love we have for our brothers and sisters in Christ? If the church would be the church and love each other and love the world like this, I wonder what kind of world we would have. You know, it's amazing to me that people can put so much emphasis, and I do, on doctrine on demonstration. We need the prophetic. We need miracles. We need healing. We need, you know, heaven on earth. We need, oh yes, hallelujah. Let's do it. But what about love? Do, do we, is, is that our motivation or is it just kind of getting the word out there, building our organization up? Um, you know, the, the motivation, I mean, in, in a way you got to think about it, right? It's not, the core motivation isn't just spreading the gospel, Right? Why? Because what's your motivation for spreading the gospel? It needs to be love, right? What? Oh, I just want to see great things happen for God. Well, but what's the motivation? Is the motivation proving people that you know God exists, or proving to people that you know your version of you know, whatever is correct, or is it no? I want to see people that are sick healed, so they can be healed and not be suffering. No, I want to see people filled with the Spirit. Why? So, so they can have power to overcome. Because I love them and I see what they're struggling with and I know that God has given us power to overcome. Right? And, and this actually gets to one point that I really wanted to make as it comes to Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and, and his speech. Right? He, he points out that they were living less than they should. Living less than what was actually technically provided. Well, does that happen to us? Do we live lives in Christ less than what we really should? What's been provided? Christ has opened up all these incredible things for us, and, and yet we just kind of treat him and treat, treat this life as 
kind of a, you know, Sunday to Sunday, kick the can over to the next week. You know, hopefully I can just get by one more week, one more day. Or do we live victoriously, even in the midst of opposition or hurt or, uh, or, 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 or trial or tribulation? Do we live victorious over sin? Or is our struggle, I, I mean, kind of like a, I'm not sure which one's going to win today. Or is the struggle more, no, I'm victorious in Christ. He has given me power over sin. You know, the scriptures teach us that we are made free from sin, that we can overcome sin. Um, But is that how we live? Is that how, or do we live less than? In many religious environments, people are, I mean, they're, they're really, they're forced to live less than what is provided. We talked last week a little bit about how, the job of the fivefold ministry is to empower and to equip people to do ministry. But in many places, that's not the case. The fivefold ministry, if it's even fivefold, right? Some places it's like onefold, twofold, maybe threefold. Um, but that's neither here nor there for this podcast. <laughs> uh, but but are we living less than what God's provided because of a religious system of uh, you know, of tyrannical doctrine? Uh, again, do we live in this unjust system, this unjust spiritual system that is forcing us to live lives less than what Christ has provided? Well, I'm here to say for those of you in that boat, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty. We are free at last. You can be free in Christ it, will it take some personal sacrifice? Uh, yeah. Actually, a quote from Martin Luther King says, Nothing worthwhile is gained without sacrifice. Imagine that. But we all kind of know this. I mean, if, if something doesn't really cost anything, I mean, it's not going to be worth much. You know, uh, a relationship that takes no work probably isn't all that great of a relationship. I mean, it takes work. It takes some pouring into. It takes some forgiveness. It takes some understanding. It takes some love. It takes, you know, um, you go and you go and give somebody something, even if it's an expensive something. Sometimes it can be treated with disdain over time, right? Why? Because it didn't really cost them anything. Often that happens. Why? Nothing worthwhile is gained without sacrifice. Sacrifice is required if something is of true value and worth. And I'm going to say that if you want to be free, if I want to be free to live what Christ has provided, it is going to cost. There's going to be fasting and prayer. There's going to be tears sown. Okay? There will be people that look at you and hate you for what you're trying to do in Christ. Oh, oh, who do you think you are? I think I'm nobody, but I'd like to follow Christ if that's okay. Oh, what are you trying to prove? Well, I'm not trying to prove anything except that I love Jesus and I want to follow him. You know, there's going to be people that come against you. I mean, there. You know, why do we have so many denominations? Well, because everybody's got the little candy stick about, you know, uh, believe this thing, believe that thing, and we don't, what, go back to those founding documents, the foundation, which is the Word of God. Or we can't let our pride get out of the way and sit down and chat. And let's, let's hear your points. Let's hear mine. Let's come to what these scriptures are saying. Why don't we lock ourselves in a room uh, you know, 10 or 12 of us, different people from different denominations, fast and pray for a week, study the scriptures, and just seek God and find out what the truth is. Well, again, there's too much humanity that plays into this. But if there was true love, well, what would it look like? Love is willing to sacrifice. Love is willing to put in the hard work, right? Love is patient. Love is kind. Doesn't envy. That stuff takes work. It's easy to be impatient, unkind, envious, boastful, and proud. It's easy to be rude and self-seeking. Self-seeking is normal, natural. That you Don't do anything at all and you're going to be self-seeking, easily angered. Uh, to not get angry, to allow yourself to have control, self-control, these types of things, that takes work, that takes sacrifice. It's not that difficult to be unloving. You know, love love doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth, right? Protects, trusts, hopes, perseveres. It's easy not to persevere. It's easy to give up. What do you have to do in order to give up? Nothing. Just stop. <laughs> I mean, you know, 
that that is the key. That's the thing. Love persists. Love is the chief ingredient of the walk with Christ. But so many people chuck love right out the window, or they talk about it and 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 talk about it and uh, talk about it and you know emphasize it. But then it's not real love. It's 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 there's no sacrifice involved. It's just manby pamby. Is it manby pamby or namby pamby? I'll have to look that up. Um, it's just, you know, it's this frivolous, a lot of times, just permissiveness is what it really is. Uh, it's really just a, 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 a scapegoat to uh, not have to deal with things, not sacrifice your own feelings, sacrifice your own discomfort, and maybe speak truth, or maybe call out sin, or maybe say something that, yeah, it's going to hurt their feelings, but it's going to save their soul. No, 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 that's not love. Oh, yes, it is love, right? I used the demonstration uh, recently. You know, somebody's uh, walking in the street, texting or something, and a, and a truck's barreling down on them, right? It's not loving to sit there and be like, well, you know, I don't want to disrupt them. That might be an important text. You know, well, I see that truck getting ready to hit them, but, you know, if I run over there and knock them out of the way, I mean, maybe I'll hurt them. Maybe, you know, they might skin their knee. No, love is going to jump over there and get them out of the way. They may, hey, maybe their phone breaks. But, dude, I saved your life, (laughs) right? But this is exactly what a lot of places do, and they call it love, and it's not love. So, nothing worthwhile is gained without sacrifice. Awesome quote from, from Martin Luther King. Now, the last thing I wanted to talk about is... Uh, a quote, again, attributable to Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? What are you doing for others? I want to encourage you. Last week we talked about ministry and body ministry, and this kind of connects with that, but here's the deal. What are you doing for others? You know, the life of a saint of God, a brother and sister in Christ, a, a Christian uh, in the scriptural context of that word, it, it's going to lead us to understand we've got to be walking in love. And walking in love naturally leads to service. It leads to service. If you truly love, you will serve. You will find a place in the kingdom of God, in the body of Christ where you can pour into other people. Maybe it's teaching. Maybe it's, uh, as I mentioned last week, you know, it's visiting people in the hospital. Maybe it's cooking a meal and visiting someone who is going through a rough time right now. Uh, maybe it's going deep in prayer and, and and digging things out in the spirit. I mean, you're 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 busting down strongholds. You are uh, um, warring in the spirit in your prayer closet. So that when we get into a service on a Sunday morning or a Bible study or a prayer meeting on a Thursday night or something, uh, chains are falling off of people. People are loose. The the fog has cleared in their in their vision, and they can see Christ uh, in reality. Right. So so we need to not live lives less than what God has provided. We need to live lives that are full of love. And allow that love to lead us into service in the body of Christ. Now, that's uh, that's the kind of uh, the portion of this podcast for the folks that are you're in the body of Christ in some way, shape, or form. Maybe you're brand new. Take it. Listen. Don't learn bad stuff. <laughs> don't don't learn the fundamentals from somebody that never actually learned them themselves. Um, Don't pick up bad habits, but listen to this and you will do well. Come on into the body of Christ. Learn to love for real, 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love, and let it drive you to service. Now, let me shift gears very quickly and say to someone who is maybe you're on the edge, you're not in Christ, but you are living less than what Christ provided. He has provided for you the ability to be in relationship with Him, the God of the universe. He has provided for you the opportunity to overcome the struggles that you have through His power, through His Word, through His Spirit, through His blood. I'm here to tell you, if you are living in sin, you are living below 
what God wants for you. You are created in the image of God, and you are made to be an image bearer of that God. He wants to live inside of you. Now, that's crazy. I know. I, just the God of the universe that said, let there be light, and bam, right? Uh, he wants to come and live inside of you. He wants to have a personal relationship with you, not because he thinks that's cool or he wants to show off, but because he loves you. And so don't live in a system that is unjust and immoral that is pushing you away from the God who created and has saved you. Instead, come into his light, accept his love, and you will be living the life that was paid for through Jesus Christ and that he wants for you. And of course, I and other people in the body of Christ want for you as well. Father, I ask you by your wonderful, your wonderful name, Jesus Christ, I ask you, I implore you, please let the people who have listened to this podcast, who will listen to it, let them be blessed. Help us to live lives full of love, to remove bitterness. If we've come from a religious background, thank you, Jesus, that you brought us out, but don't let us be embittered toward what possibly led us to you. Let us take the good and leave the bad. Don't let us be embittered or, or, or start to hate or look down on people still stuck in that area, but let us love truly. Let us love the body of Christ, those that are in the kingdom of God, so we can truly be the disciples of Jesus Christ. Help us to love not just in word, but in deed as your word says to do. Help us to love that 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love, the kind of love that will bring someone out of the world, out of sin, out of darkness, in into the marvelous light and grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, the kind of love that will drive us to serve others, to serve God. Father, I bless your holy name. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. I love you guys. God bless you, and I hope that you'll stick with us. We'll catch you on the next podcast. See you then in Jesus' name.